Let me start out by, by um, maybe disappointing some of you and, and maybe encouraging others of you. Uh, although the word philosophy occurs in the title of this, a philosophy of quantum mechanics, this is really a course just on quantum mechanics. It's on quantum theory. It's not particularly about philosophy. It's in the foundations of physics. I do this work together with the people who sit in physics departments and people who sit in math departments. And, uh, and so the philosophical aspect is really merely being particularly clear, trying to be very clear conceptually about what's going on. But physicists do that. Good physicists do that very well, as well as philosophers. So there's not really going to be a lot of philosophy. Um, let me encourage you in the following sense. I, I talked to someone, and I said, I'm giving a course on quantum theory. And he said, do you understand the math? And it, it's a, the math is actually quite simple. There's nothing mathematical uh, that will stand in anyone's way if, you, if, you, if you've managed to grasp the following concept, mathematical concept, which I have on the board beside me. We'll get to that. Even and odd. Okay? If you're clear on even and odd, you're golden. I'm going to give you a mathematical proof. I mean, it's a real honest-to-God mathematical proof, and it won't require anything more than keeping track of even and odd. And it's perhaps the most astonishing and surprising thing that's been discovered, I would claim, about the physical world in the history of mankind. But you should be able to understand everything. So if there's anything I say that you didn't follow, it's my fault. It's not your fault. Okay? And you should, in the question session, just throw a rock at me and say, I didn't get that. Okay? There's n absolutely nothing that you should leave fuzzy in your head, or that's too deep for me, or my mind is blown you know, conceptually or something. Right? So this is really to get very clear on two things, and they divide into the two lectures. The first lecture is what we found out for sure, which as I say is going to be a really astonishing thing to find out about the physical world. And the second lecture is what we still don't understand and what the possibilities are, although we don't know what quantum mechanics is telling us about the world. Different possibilities are being explored and developed, and you should be able to understand what those possibilities are and why they differ from each other. Now, there's been a tremendous amount of mystery that's come to surround quantum theory, uh, some of it quite intentionally. Niels Bohr is the source of a lot of it, and Niels Bohr was quite fond of mystery and obscurity. Um, Bohr, I'll just give you beforehand, because we're going to be talking about Einstein's objections to the, what's called the Copenhagen interpretation, or the Copenhagen school of understanding quantum theory. And Bohr thought the deep idea was something he called complementarity, which I'll talk a little bit about, but not a lot. But the deal with complementarity is that you have two sorts of properties that exclude each other. So you can have either you want, but if you have one, you can't have the other. And the more you have of one, the less you have to have of the other. And, and Bohr thought it was this existence of complementarity that was the source of all the amazing things about quantum theory and about the world in general. And he tried to extend it everywhere and saw complementarity everywhere. Uh, and so you would have properties that are complementary. So the position and momentum of a particle were supposed to be complementary. Um, and someone once asked Bohr, well, what's complementary to truth? And he said, clarity. <laughs> so he was trying to tell you that the more obscure what he said was, the truer it was. And the better you could understand it, the less true it was. Which is just, you know, I mean, this is just a counsel of despair. <laughs> but that's completely wrong. You can have absolutely clear, understandable, and true 
claims that you, that, that you should grasp and, and completely understand. Now, what I want to do is start just historically to get you a feel of how contentious the surroundings of quantum theory were, and I'm going to do it with Einstein, because Einstein is known to have been someone who is very skeptical or critical of, of the Copenhagen School. So uh, why, why did Einstein hate quantum theory? And there's a kind of mythology that's grown up about this, and I'm going to explain the mythology, and I'm going to explain why it is mythology. Um, so, oh my gosh, I, I fixed these and now it's cutting in the middle of words. Oh well, nothing I can do about it now. So, uh, but in, in case you can't read it, I'll just read these out aloud, right? So there are two uh, phrases that are perennially associated with Einstein's distaste for quantum theory, that he would make these complaints. The first one is, God does not play dice. Right? Which he did say that in different places, he never actually mentions, well, der Alte, right, the old man, or Herr Gott, uh, würfelt nicht, right? God does not play dice with the universe. And that clearly had something to do with the idea of the failure of determinism, the introduction of probabilities, the idea that different things could happen. And the other thing he complained about is translated into English, spooky action at a distance. Spukhafte, right? So it's really a straight translation. Spukhafte Fehlungwirkung. So that's exactly what it is. And these were the things he didn't like about the standard Copenhagen view. Um, here, just to get clear about where Einstein stood on both of these issues, I have some quotations from letters back and forth. Uh, for those of you who plan to sit the exam, this will come up in the exam. <laughs> it, it, I've never done a multiple choice exam before. It's a hard exam. I gave it to friends of mine who are experts in this field and they couldn't get it right. So <laughs> I, I, I should say also, from what you get, I mean, you should be very proud. If you follow all this and walk out of this tent and understand this, you will understand more about the foundations of quantum theory than an average physics PhD. And I'm not kidding, because it is not part of a physics education. It just isn't part of it to discuss the things I'm discussing today. It's not in the textbooks. They don't give courses on it. Some physicists, you know, in their spare time are interested. But the average physicist will, will, will be no better off, will be worse off than you after this course. All right. So this was in a letter from Wolfgang Pauli to Max Born, and you, you'll pick up the, the, the context well enough. So again, also, Einstein gave me your manuscript to read. He was not at all annoyed with you, but only said you were a person who will not listen, which this comes up a lot in this history, people who won't listen. Uh, this agrees with the impression I have formed myself insofar as a, unable to recognize Einstein whenever you talked about him. It seemed to me as if you had erected some dummy Einstein for yourself, which you then knocked down with great uh, pomp. In particular, Einstein does not consider the concept of determinism to be as fundamental as it is frequently held to be, as he has told me emphatically many times. And he denied energetically that he had ever put up a postulate such as the sequence of such conditions must also be objective and real, that is automatic, machine-like, deterministic. So Einstein is denying that he was insisting on determinism and that it was a mistake to think that. And, and if you said, as many people have said, Einstein could never get with the program, right? He would, became kind of a bitter old man because he could never get on board with indeterminism because he was just an old fuddy-duddy, okay? This is not true at all. Uh, letter from Einstein to Max Born. I just want to explain what I mean when I say we should try to hold on to physical reality, which he very strongly believed in physical reality. You wouldn't think that would be strange for a physicist to believe in physical reality, but things get weird. Whatever we regard as existing, real, should somehow be localized in space and time. So this was, this was something Einstein deeply believed, this localization principle. That is, the real 
part, uh, uh, the real in part of space A should in theory somehow exist independently of what is thought of as real in space B. That, w boy, they've cut this in strange places. That which really exists in B should therefore not depend in what kind of measurement is carried out in part of space A. It should also be independent of whether or not any measurement at all is carried out in space A. If one adheres to this program, one can hardly consider the quantum theoretical description as a complete representation of the physically real. Now, there's a lot in this we're going to understand better later, but here Einstein's saying, look, somehow or other, here's part of space A, here's part of space B. There should be some physical fact about what's going on here that can be stated independently of what's going on here. There should be some physical fact about what's going on here that's independent of here. And what's happening here should be independent of whether or not you're doing an experiment over here. So you sort of see how this is non-locality. You can sort of see how if you denied this, you might say that's spooky action at a distance. How could my doing an experiment over here have some immediate effect far away? That's what Einstein worried about. Uh, now, to continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.